Without a revival of classical philosophy, the Renaissance wouldn't have occurred. In fact, that's what the name Renaissance means, right? A rebirth of classicism, especially classical philosophies. Once the Catholic Church had less of a hold on the dissemination of information in the years leading up to the Renaissance, classical ideas became more accepted. We hear a lot about the Italian Renaissance and the Platonic kinds of ideas that were revived there. But there was a very different kind of renaissance happening in the northern parts of Europe. And they, instead of looking to the theories of Plato, were fascinated by the philosophies of Aristotle. So let's talk about some of the basics. Uh, Aristotelian philosophy is very different in approach versus Platonic kinds of ideas. Uh, Plato was all about abstract thinking as a way to uncover truth. Instead, Aristotle is all about finding truth through sensory experiences, through empirical kinds of experiences. And one of the things that Aristotle says is that in the beginning, when we first come to earth, our minds are blank. They're empty and they are filled up over the course of our lives through our sensory experiences, through our empirical kinds of experiences. So this emphasis on empiricism, this emphasis on looking to the world around you as a way to find knowledge and truth is going to be heavily influential for Northern Renaissance art. Now, how did people, scholars, intellectuals, artists, how were they aware of these ideas in the North during the Renaissance. We have to understand that vernacular translations were really crucial for spreading these ideas from classical antiquity. Just as we had vernacular translations of ideas like Plato and humanism in the southern parts of Europe during the Renaissance, we also have vernacular translations that are making their way north and they're becoming very popular there. Uh, Thomas Aquinas is actually a 13th century theologian and scholar. He's actually Italian. Um, one of his works that he's most well known for is Summa Theologica, where he kind of approaches human understanding and even religion through Aristotelian empiricism and uh, kind of empirical methods. Uh, Thomas Aquinas' theories and writings became very, very popular in the North in the years leading up to the Renaissance. He translated a lot of Aristotle's philosophies into the vernacular, and those ideas then became widely disseminated in Northern Europe, especially in courts that were supporting both scholars, intellectuals, and artists. So these ideas of Aristotle's really spread in the North during the Renaissance. So, if we're talking about the empirical emphasis as being an Aristotelian outlook for, um, for the Renaissance in the North, we have to understand how that impacts the art of the era. The art of this time is often called Ars Nova, and it shows a heavy, heavy influence of an empirical kind of outlook. Most often we see these uh, in some main hallmarks of Ars Nova style, texture, is one of the main hallmarks, believable textures, minute details, really convincingly portrayed is another hallmark. Believable colors is another key indicator of an empirical outlook in Ars Nova. The fourth is disguised symbolism, which was also very important. What this is, is normal everyday objects that now carry religious significance. Since artists that were trying to be Aristotelian did not want their uh, symbolism to be obvious and overt because that would take away from the naturalism of the scene. They moved towards this new trend of disguised symbolism where they use common household everyday types of objects to have religious significance. And what we have to understand is that these key hallmarks of Ars Nova really wouldn't have been possible if artists in the North hadn't become uh, familiar with oil paints. Oil paint is a medium that takes a longer time to dry, and they use that long working time to work in all of that emphasis on texture, detail, colors, and uh, the disguise symbols. So we do see these main hallmarks in Ars Nova to show the empirical attention that is characteristic of this artistic style. But we have some other kind of um, elements that creep into the artistic style that we should note as well. We do see a lot of unidealized and contemporary figures. The figures look like normal people looked in the North during the time of the Renaissance. We see a lot of naturalism in the figures, meaning their proportions look pretty accurate, their poses look pretty naturalistic. We see a lot of naturalism in motifs and details. So artists are paying attention if they're painting a certain type 
type of costume. They're paying attention to what does the texture of this specific fabric look like and how does it how does it fold and how does it hang? So they're paying attention to all of those little details, including a lot of naturalism. We also see in Ars Nova contemporary settings that are very naturalistic in their appearance. We see an emphasis on making bodies look three-dimensional. They're using techniques of modeling and chiaroscuro to do that. So modeling and chiaroscuro are contrasts of light and dark that create the feel of three-dimensionality and in fact what a lot of artists did during the northern renaissance is they would first paint their figures in grisaille which is essentially almost like a black and white of the figure so they could get all of those tonalities of shades just right to make them look three-dimensional and then they would add a layer of oil glaze on the top to add the color uh, Ars Nova also shows an attention to making the world look naturalistic and believable by using intuitive perspective and atmospheric perspective. Artists in the North don't necessarily know how to do mathematical perspective in the early part of the Renaissance, unlike their Italian counterparts, but they do understand just kind of the basics of perspective from their own experience looking at the world around them. So they do it intuitively. They kind of eyeball the perspective. And then, of course, these rich oil colors. This is another key characteristic of Ars Nova. So let's look at some examples of what this means in art. How do these words that we've listed here as being empirical characteristics of Ars Nova actually look when you see them in Northern Renaissance pieces? We're looking here first at a detail from Jan van Eyck. And here you can see he was a real master of creating incredibly believable textures and incredibly specific minute details in his works. In fact, the legend is that Van Eyck likely painted with a one-haired brush. He is one of the most well-known artists of the Northern Renaissance and looking here at this detail you can see just how capable he was in manipulating paint to make it believably look like actual fabric, like actual brocade, like actual gold thread, like actual metal pearls and jewels. Here's another detail from a different Van Eyck work. You can see how he differentiates the, the feel of the materials. There's a different texture and feel to the tile versus the fur trim versus the brocade of the end or the bottom of this drapery. And it's almost as though we can see uh, the individual threads on the brocade. Here's yet another detail from Van Eyck, from his Madonna and Canon van der Pila. This one here shows that he's using a contemporary setting. He's using some intuitive perspective. He's using some modeling to create a sense of three-dimensionality on the figures. So we've got those contrasts of uh, light and dark to make them look three-dimensional. Again, this shows as well the emphasis on texture, minute details of each individual thread, each jewel, each hair. The contemporary um, elements here are strong, but this is also a great example of showing how Van Eyck was one who could capture an accurate physical likeness, a portrait. And we have a portrait of Canon van der Pila here. You can see that he is not idealized. And in the North, that lack of idealization is very different from what we usually see in Italian works from the same period. Here's a different artist from the Northern Renaissance. This is Campan. Uh, you can see here he's modeled and created a three-dimensional feel to the figures. He's using a contemporary setting. And this is a wonderful example of some of those naturalistic details that you can see in the contemporary uh, setting. You can look at this stable and you can see the way that it was constructed. You can see where it's dilapidated and falling apart. So a lot of those naturalistic touches there. You can see the figures are wearing contemporary costumes. They are unidealized with the exception of Mary, right? Who is uh, usually shown in an ideal way as is appropriate for her holiness. This last example is from Rogier van der Weyden. These three artists, Campan, Van Eyck, and van der Weyden are the most well-known of the Northern Renaissance. They knew each other and the awareness of the work of each individual artist shows up in the works of all three artists. So here in Roger van der Weyden's uh, triptych, we can see not only contemporary figures and believable modeling and naturalism in the poses and faces, 
And we also see a really good example of how Northern Renaissance artists approach space. He's done perspective intuitively here, and he's also using atmospheric perspective to enhance the sense of space. Atmospheric perspective is the way that um, landscapes and settings lose their detail, lose their color saturation as they recede away in the distance. So here you can see that, you know, the hills as they get farther away are a little bit hazier and a little more grayed out. Looking then at the art style of the North during the Renaissance versus that of Italians during the Renaissance is very different. And we can't really understand what's driving this focus on naturalism in texture and detail and color and in all the other ways that Ars Nova shows that empirical attention without understanding the emphasis of Aristotelian philosophies.